let's just dive in. What are the main principles? What are the four principles for the architecture to be considered cloud native? Yeah, maybe I'll start with, uh, you know, talking about a very common misnomer, right? When people talk about cloud native, uh, I have actually seen that, uh, you know, people mistake that to be the same as cloud. So one way to look at it is, you know, the similarity between cloud and cloud native is as similar or dissimilar as Java and JavaScript, right? When people talk about cloud, they're essentially talking about, uh, they're referring uh, to public cloud environments like AWS, you know, Google Cloud and Azure and things like that. But cloud native on the other hand is a, uh, think about it just it as an architectural paradigm where you architect your software in such a way that it becomes a lot easier to go deploy these applications. It becomes a lot easier to manage their life cycle, you know, things like upgrading and, uh, you know, scaling them up and down based on varying demands and so on, right? So they are fundamentally different uh, uh, constructs when you talk about cloud native versus, uh, versus cloud, right? Now, um, your question was on, um, you know, the benefits of uh, uh, cloud native, right? Uh, Let's start with like basics, right? So let's just give our viewers a refresher. So mm -hmm. um, what is web scale? How containers and microservices uh, fit in the whole overall architecture? How you utilize CI and CD to automate and make upgrades? So all that good technical stuff. Sure. So actually, let's look at a problem and it will help us understand you know, how it ties into cloud native. Let's say a very simple uh, example would be, let's say somebody is building a web service, right? In that web service, the way they would normally do it is that they would create a web server and some application uh, software behind it and a database software behind that. Now let's assume that the load on the web server increases because somebody posted something interesting and that goes viral and there's a lot of load coming in, right? Traditionally, what people have been doing in order to scale for that is there would be tools that would monitor for whether the load is increasing. If it does, then they would essentially manually trigger, uh, you know, scaling out that web server, if that web server supports it, putting a load balancer in front, manually configuring the load balancer to see the newly added web servers and so on. So that it had been a very, you know, uh, a manual process of both monitoring and adjusting to the changes that are happening. What cloud native uh, does is that it basically shifts that from being manual into things that are very automated. Uh, when you do that, essentially, you don't really have to have humans managing any of these things. You can set up policies that monitor and then adjust the uh, capacity accordingly. But in order to do that, you have to essentially uh, implement your software using certain patterns, certain uh, uh, certain themes, right? Number one is you mentioned uh, uh, containers. So containers are a way in which you can package your applications so that they are a single unit that can be deployed very easily, booted up very easily because you're not putting up an entire operating system like you do with a, with a virtual machine and so on. And then it basically it is designed in such a way that the, the application itself can be horizontally scaled with a load balancer that is automatically programmed as the scale of those instances of the web server increases, right? So cloud native, I think the fundamental way of looking at it is it's basically a packaging of your application as a collection of what they call as microservices, right? Each of those microservices running inside an application framework called containers. I think that is the way to look at uh, uh, cloud native. Perfect. And then those microservices, they can be spun on demand. They can be automated with CI, CD. So there's right. a lot of benefits to mobile operators with automation because the architecture is so flexible and dynamic. And that I know that um, Rakuten Mobile was the first one that deployed cloud native architecture in their live network. Mm -hmm. And they benefited from those principles. So mm -hmm. can you tell our listeners what are four principles, benefits that um, Rakuten Mobile 
benefited from. So, uh, okay, let's let's look at the little bit of history behind this, right? So, when Rakuten Mobile started in Japan in 2018, uh, they 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 debated two models. Model one is a status quo model, and model two, a status quo model, essentially means you you deploy your network using a collection of hardware appliances, fully vertically, vertically integrated software, hardware stacks, and so on, which is what most of the mobile operators have been doing. Or the alternative is, can we bring the learnings and the benefits that the IT industry has seen in terms of software-driven application deployment, network function deployment, and all that, as well as software-defined programmable you know, operations? If we were to bring that, right, those benefits to network operations, what would be the benefit that we would see? So first, it was a theoretical exercise to understand what those benefits are. And what we realize is that we can decrease the cost significantly by doing that. And we'll talk about how in a minute. Uh, and we can also improve our operational efficiencies, right? So that was the initial theoretical exercise. And then, of course, we went about thinking about how we would essentially bring that to life. Now, what we have done at Rakuten Mobile is that we've taken the approach of software-driven everything right from the far-edge locations where you run your RAN applications, right, the DU uh, portion of RAN, all the way into regional data centers where you would run your D CU component of RAN, and then into the central data center where you would run your OSs, BSs, and all those things. And the approach that we've taken is, number one is, Let's make all these components in the telco uh, stack run on pure software on commodity hardware. So you have okay, done so a number one. Number one is software. Software running on commodity hardware. Okay. So that of one. course means that of course means a couple of things. Number one, we essentially can benefit from the cost advantages that commodity hardware gives, gives us. Number two, because it is software driven we can essentially apply programmability when it comes to doing deployment as well as lifecycle management, just as an example. So when we deployed our RAN software, uh, we wanted to upgrade the network as frequently as possible, adding new features, you know, improving the efficiency, improving performance, and so on, which means that our RAN vendor, Altiostar, was providing us software bits as upgraded bits, right? Now, because it is software-based and because we had a programmable operations uh, uh, you know, the paradigm that we took, we were able to apply these upgrades very quickly. All automated, all through a CI CD pipeline, right? You'd essentially, our network vendor would upload their bits to a repository. From that repository, you could drive the entire upgrade cycle in a very automated way, right? That's only possible because it's all software driven. So that's the first uh, benefit, right? Commodity hardware, software driven. The second uh, approach that we took is we want it to be truly cloud native. Software alone does not mean it's cloud native. To be truly cloud native, it essentially means that you would decompose your applications into the smallest possible microservices. Correct? Uh, and we worked with our you know, the ecosystem vendors to make them you know, see the benefits of doing it, you know, converting their monolithic applications to microservices. Of course, it was a big advantage to us that the industry itself was going down this journey of you know, transformation and you know, from VNFs to CNFs and all that. So we benefited from that mindset share shift also. But we actually made the vendors, uh, you know, implement uh, CNF. That gave us other advantages. The advantage that we got with that is we had one consistent model to which we could go and do upgrades for dissimilar, if you will, right, the network functions. The network function came from vendor one versus vendor two versus vendor three. We could create a workflow to do upgrades. That we could create a workflow to do scaling and all those things, right? Log collection, for example, how you would be able to do, you know, monitoring of the metrics and all that, right? We could create a consistency. Now imagine the benefit of that. There's a cost benefit, obviously, because you have one common system. There's also a efficiency benefit because we can take a smaller operations team and now manage a wide variety of different network functions. Right, so those are the kind of benefits that we saw, and that's how we had implemented uh, uh, the rapid mobile network. Um, let me ask another question. This is really fascinating. So you delivered through 
software, commodity hardware, um, distributed CI, CD pipelines, you delivered ease of deployments, um, speed of deployment, and as a result, overall lost TCO. Mm -hmm. Rakuten Mobile is a green field operator. Mm -hmm. What is your take on applying the same principles to deliver ease of deployment, speed of deployment, TCO, agility, flexibility to brownfield operators? Do you think that that is doable? Yeah, this is a great question because, you know, this is a question that we have internally thought about, uh, you know, in our organization, as well as we get asked by the brownfield operators. But let me give it a slightly historical perspective, right? When we started this journey of doing everything software-based, you know, cloud-native at Rakuten Mobile, there were too many naysayers saying that, oh, it's not going to work. I, I distinctly remember, uh, I think in 2018 or 2019, I was at a GSMA event, and uh, there were operators who were presenting, and the issue of, you know, the topic of uh, Rakuten Mobile came up. And there was skepticism. They said, oh, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen, right? So... Obviously, we showed that it is possible. Then from skeptic skepticism that it's not going to happen, the discussion shifted to, yeah, it's because it's greenfield. You know, you can do it. But yeah, it makes sense. The, the theory seems uh, right, right? Yeah, it's greenfield, so we have the flexibility and all that. Now the discussion is moving from oh, what, what can they, can brownfields essentially benefit from this? And we are essentially working with a few brownfield operators. So I'll tell you how we are looking at um, cracking this uh, problem, right? Okay. So obviously, Brownfield ha has a lot of incumbency challenges, right? They have incumbent software vendors, incumbent processes, and so on. But they do see that there is a benefit if you go down the path of software-based uh, implementation, the benefit of cloud-native implementation, right? So we give them two options, right? Option number one is in the network side. Option number two is in the non-network side. On the network side, they can start off with a few sites and experiment and get familiarized with what it means to be doing disaggregated open RAM on pure software, okay? Uh, it also allows them to essentially, when, it, when they do it on a few sites, it allows them to get familiarized, not just to the technology, but also makes their operations teams familiarized with the new age technology like cloud native or not, right? So it's a good starting point. You don't have to disrupt everything. Take a few sites and start there. That's on the pure, you know, the RAM network side. But there's also, in telco side, it's not just on the network. There's a lot of other applications that run in the back. End. Those applications are essentially, the vendors of those applications are already supporting CNF-based implementations of such things, right? Whether it is a CAPS or whatever, even OSS platforms, BSS platforms, and so on. So we basically said, you can start there. That's a second way of trying out uh, cloud-native and familiarizing yourself, right? So this is how... We believe the brownfield will make an entry into cloud native software driven uh, implementation. Uh, once they get familiarized again, as I said, with the technology, but as importantly, their people getting familiarized with the new way of doing things, that is where I think the acceleration will happen. Correct? So we do fundamentally believe that the brownfields will go down this path. They went from skepticism to that it's not possible to, yeah, it is possible, but it's not for us. They will shift into, yeah, it is possible even for us, but it is, you know, we have to have that mindset uh, change also at our end, right? So I think that I'm seeing that transition already. Uh, it is slower than what uh, we would hope for, but it is happening for sure. But once they start to see the initial success, I'm pretty sure it's going to ramp up much faster. That is a um, fascinating journey because it only happened in the last five years since 2018. 2023. So, um, and addressing it from the talent perspective is the right way as well, because at TIP, we have TIP Academy where we educate on open RAN. We have different types of courses. We're hoping to build other types of curricular as well. Mm -hmm. So, last question. We talked a lot about mobile networks supporting end users with cloud native architectures. Can cloud native architecture support other use cases 
other use cases, meaning edge use case or 5G use case. 5G probably it's, you know, cellular, but um, latency dependent use cases, for example, metaverse, can that be done? Yeah, we strongly believe it can be done because we have internally proven ourselves that very low latency applications at the distributed edge, uh, distributed stateful edge is, uh, is, is a reality, right? It is possible technology-wise for sure because we already have the technology in-house to do that. Uh, and I, I believe that the compelling reason why people will go down that path is because the moment you mentioned edge, right? The moment you go to the edge, the type of challenges you see are would require that things be done more programmatic manner and in an automated manner. I mean, just to kind of give you an example, right? Let's say that you were your entire network was running in one large data center, right? The way you would manage that data center would be through a set of human beings writing some tools and managing that. Now, imagine the case where you unwrap the whole thing. Instead of one large, one or two large data centers, you're running on tens and thousands of small, very small edge data centers, right? The paradigm shift has already happened. Now you essentially have to figure out how do you essentially instantiate even the operating system on all the servers in all your 10,000 locations? How do you instantiate your platform? How do you essentially push the software bits, right? So I think, and by the way, not, not just think, we have, internally we have done that. So we have a very strong feeling that cloud native for the distributed edge where low latency matters is, is a reality and we are already benefiting from deploying it uh, internally. That is really, really cool. And on that note, I'm going to ask you, I know I said last question, but I want to ask one more because with this answer about how you're innovating, you gave me idea for another question. So we talked mm -hmm. about the last five years, how industry evolved from... Um, different approach, traditional building approach um, on hardware building networks to software-based approach, how naysayers now are deploying cloud native and benefiting from cloud native. So what do you think is, if you had a crystal ball, what's in the store for the next five years? Yeah, so um, I think there are some very, very, very compelling things that we could, uh, uh, we, we would see in the next five years, right? Something that we are already exploring ourselves. The first thing I would say is energy, right? Energy footprint. Um, I mean, you also come from the telco background and you're very familiar with this, right? Once you deploy at scale and when you're running at very large operations, your energy costs shoot up. You're essentially spending a lot of money just on power, right? So one of the things that we are looking at very, deeply is, can we use techniques to actually bring down the energy footprint on energy cost of running your network? Because that is a significant line item in your budget, correct? Uh, and there are several techniques that we are exploring. Uh, I think we are seeing some initial positive results in that. That is, we, we believe that in the next five years, that will become a very normal conversation to have, right? Is your platform decreasing the energy footprint? With all climate change and the focus on that, I think that's also a very, as a social cause, also I think it's a very important one. The second one I would say is, because we have taken a software-driven approach, because we have taken a cloud-native approach, we are sitting on a gold mine of data, right? What is happening in the network, right? Where is the capacity? Where are the failure points and all that stuff, right? Where is the performance peaks and drops and so on? So, on. so we are collecting this information, and when you collect a such a large amount of information, it leads to what? It leads to the ability for machines to learn, mine and learn from that information, right? So we are focusing on that as well. Can we use that data that we have collected over the last you know, several years? And can we build better models, better models that will drive down our cost further, better models that will ensure the reliability of our software, better model that will help our procurement teams forecast where the capacity is going to increase, when it's going to increase. Better models that will help our operations teams decrease the time to resolve issues when they get them, so on, right? That's all possible because, you know, you're running a large network in a very software-driven manner. So I think the next five years, since we have 
proven that it is possible. We have proven the benefits of it. We are going to take that and then do things like innovations like energy management, innovations like machine learning applied against you know on network operations and so on. That sounds great. So in five years, let's have another conversation <laughs> and see if your predictions about reducing energy consumption, increasing energy efficiency, and building AI and ML models to optimize network management come true. I think they will. Yeah, we are really looking forward to it. In fact, as I said, right, we are not just a... Uh, observer in this, right? We are the ones who are doing these things, right? So we are truly excited. Obviously, we truly have deep conviction that it is the way the industry is going to go. Uh, but yeah, in five years, let's uh, touch base again and see whether my predictions uh, turn out to be true or not. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much, Parthar, for your time. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. We'll see you yeah, next thank time. You.